Our next speaker, uh, Hussain Gazelle, has actually kind of been in my fuel cell personal world space, you know, for some time because he's been a key role, key player in the uh, DOE SECA programs. And uh, one of the things that Adaptive Materials did was uh, we went to every one of the, somebody always went to one of the SECA meetings and was taking, furiously taking notes as to, you know, things that we might be able to apply in the portable fuel cell space. So I, I'm sure some part of bits and pieces of us are we're, we're, we're indebted to uh, fuel cell energy and other folks in the DOE SECA team. So really happy that he's been able to be here and spend some time with us, both at the Green Data Center and here at the COE today. So uh, Sam Gazelle is, uh, and I is Director of Solid, uh, excuse me, Solid State Energy Conversion Alliance SECA program, the SECA program at Fuel Cell Energy. Hossein has a PhD degree from Illinois Institute of Technology and Chemical Engineering. He joined at, uh, Fuel Cell Energy in 1983, where he has been involved in research activities related to energy and electrochemical conversion devices. Hossein has participated in various aspects of fuel cell product development, including materials research, electrocatalysis, stack design, and fuel processing. He has contributed to the design and development of components for phosphoric acid fuel cells, uh, proton exchange membrane fuel cells, internal reforming carbonate fuel cells, and solid oxide fuel cell systems. Currently, Hossein leads the, leads the company's soft sea and electrochemical membrane technology development activities. Uh, excuse me, he directs a highly skilled team of scientists and engineers which are involved in all aspects of the soft sea technology development, including cell components, stack scale up, and systems design. Hossein. Only if I could learn. <laughs> 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 this, this goes up and down. Um, right. Yeah, <laughs> left and right. Left and right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. All right. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm, I'm really happy and I really enjoyed my day. Uh, Tim took me to the Green Data Center and he gave me a tour of this building. It's fascinating. So um, I'm uh, very pleased to be here. And uh, with that said, I'm going to start my presentation. A uh, few slides will talk about our company. We are one of the leading high temperature fuel cell companies, but uh, for some reasons, uh, not too many people are aware of us. So I'd like uh, two or three slides to talk a little bit about the background of the company. We were formed in 1969, uh, one of the oldest fuel cell companies. Uh, we were known by the name Energy Research Corporation, and in 1997, we changed uh, our name to Fuel Cell Energy because it was uh, time for us to graduate from research level to go to the commercial uh, business. Uh, currently, uh, we have about 300 megawatt of fuel cell, I'm sorry, uh, in front of, uh, about 300 uh, megawatt uh, fuel cell installed and in backlog. Uh, we have about 50, uh, 80 units in 50 sites all over the uh, world. Uh, and uh, our main focus right now currently on site power and, and utility support. Uh, we are basically a one-stop shop for your fuel cell needs. Uh, that means that we, we build them, or we, uh, we install them, sell them, and install them, and uh, we uh, do the service for them. So um, we do have global presence in Europe. Uh, we are a partner with a, a large organization in in Germany, Fraunhofer. We are actually have a joint venture with their ceramic division, IK, IKTS in Germany. And uh, Abangoa in Spain. Abangoa is in, uh, in the business of uh, developing um, uh, renewable fuels in, in Europe, and they are very active actually in South America also. And in Asia, we work uh, with uh, one of the large, uh, largest uh, uh, steel manufacturer in the world, POSCO. And we do have uh, a joint venture with them, uh, POSCO Energy, uh, in South Korea. In North America, of course, it's our presence uh, headquarters in uh, Danbury, Connecticut. We do have manufacturing in Turnkey, Connecticut. And we do have, uh, by acquisition, we do have two other locations in Denver, Colorado, and also in Calgary, Canada. Uh, it's a solid oxide Uh, our global manufacturing extends uh, beyond our Connecticut Torrington facility, which is about 90 megawatt of uh, multi-carbon fuel cell. DFC, of, uh, or direct fuel cell, is our trade name for uh, uh, one, of, one of the high temperature fuel cell types, fuel cells, uh, multi-carbon. 
Uh, we do have, as I mentioned, uh, we do have uh, through acquisition, we do have Versa Power Systems in uh, Calgary, Canada, which has about uh, one megawatt worth of uh, solar oxide manufacturing capability capacities in Calgary, Canada. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we also have a joint venture in Germany. We have a 20 megawatt annual uh, production facility in uh, Otto Brown in Germany. And, uh, Kohan South Korea through our collaboration with Possible Energy. We currently have a 70 megawatt production facility and there are plans to actually increase that to about 140 megawatt. So as, as you see, we have a global presence. Uh, again, I went back, sorry. Uh, just give you a flavor of some of the units that we have in the field. Uh, as I said, we have about 80 units as a product in the field and uh, they are all uh, built, built around our direct fuel cell, which is a multi component fuel cell type. Um, there are two segments of market that we are very interested in, which is natural gas, and the second one is renewable biogas. About a third of our, our units in the United States is actually run on biogas, which is very important for us. Um, uh, the top, uh, you see uh, 1.4 megawatt is uh, in California, which is actually one of our products. Um, we have a 2.4 megawatt, again, in South Korea shown in that. That pro product right now is upgraded to 2.8 megawatt, almost 3 megawatt. And um, based on that 2.4 megawatt, four of them in a, in a configuration, again, in South Korea, Korea is one of the largest fuel cell plants ever built by anybody, uh, about 11 megawatt facility. Uh, these are examples, again, uh, there is a, uh, examples of renewable gas. Uh, the gills onion is actually runs on onion juice. Uh, it's a, uh, basically, it goes through a digester and the gas goes to the fuel cell. And uh, we have a 600 kilowatt plant there. Uh, Tulare is used where we, uh, in, Cal in California, where we use uh, wastewater treatment gas. And also, Turlock is another, another uh, plant in California, which again uses wastewater treatment. Besides the multi-carbon and power plant, we also work on advanced technology. And uh, four of advanced technologies that we all we work, uh, the examples are shown here. One of them is actually is a hydrogen uh, station. What we do, fuel, our fuel source takes a natural gas and along the way inside the fuel cell, uh, it uh, converts that natural gas to hydrogen. So what we do, we tap of the anode exhaust, and now we do have hydrogen, uh, that we can either use that hydrogen inside the fuel cell to do the power generation, or whatever is left, we can put it in a, a hydrogen station and sell it as hydrogen. So we do have a, a, a memorandum of uh, understanding with, with uh, air products, and uh, this particular unit that you see up there is in California, it actually takes uh, a renewable biogas puts it on our fuel cell and we generate power, heat, and hydrogen. And the hydrogen is used in, uh, to, as a fuel station. Uh, we do have, uh, have worked on very, very high efficiency, up to 70% uh, efficiency um, a, a combined hybrid unit of fuel cell and gas turbines. And uh, that what you see is a unit which is in Canada, Toronto, Canada. And, and it uh, has run uh, close to 70% efficiency. Um, I manage a project with the uh, US uh, Department of Energy uh, to actually take our coconut fuel cell and utilize that to capture CO2 from fluid gas of another facility. It could be another power plant, could be an industrial site. Uh, the way the mortal carbon chemistry works is actually transfers carbon dioxide from cathode site to anode site. So you can imagine that you have the fuel cell running as a fuel cell, but the exhaust is also transferring CO2 from exhaust of another plant uh, to, to anode site and concentrate. That's a very exciting uh, uh, technology that we are developing. It's very unique. And uh, if you are in the carbon capture technologies, and you will notice that that's probably, there's no other technology which comes close to that. Uh, the, the, the fourth one, which is the, actually the topic of today's uh, talk, is, is a solid oxide development. 
Uh, we are looking at the solid oxide because it has advantages. In the long term, we think it could uh, substitute some of our products. And in the near term, we think it has because it's a, it has high power density and very attractive efficiencies. Uh, would be good for smaller units uh, in the range of 50 to 100 kilowatt. And of course, very, very suitable for combined heat and, and, and cooling application. And also we look at uh, defense uh, applications uh, such as UUV, UOV. And uh, uh, another side of that business is electrolyzers, high temperature electrolyzers that uh, by itself is another topic to uh, discussion. Our, our fuel cells are uh, basically anode supported, as Dr. Ron once said, anode supported fuel cells have advantages. Uh, we have uh, very uniquely, I guess in the industry is probably uh, we are the first and we still leading anybody else to actually building the cell sizes up to a thousand centimeters square. And uh, uh, we are capable, uh, our fuel cells are capable to run a range of uh, 650 to 800 degrees C. Not very hot like some of other uh, companies that uh, they develop fuel cells work on a thousand, 900 to thousand. Uh, hot enough that uh, we can get uh, utilize it for combined heat and power applications, but not hot enough that we need a ceramic bipolar place. We can use metals as our bipolar place. That's why uh, ferritic stainless steel is used as our interconnect material. Interconnect is every cell is placed on uh, basically what uh, we call interconnect, where it collects the current coming off the cell. So it go, that current goes to the next cell. So it's a very important part in terms of uh, you're going to make sure it doesn't uh, go through oxidation and, and basically uh, increase resistance over time. Uh, the temperature range that we use is good for a stainless steel uh, type of uh, interconnects. Uh, if you wear higher temperatures, you would then need to resort to a ceramic uh, interconnects. And that would become uh, a big challenge itself. Uh, we have the cross flow geometry in our uh, in our fuel cells, and uh, we typically use uh, standardized uh, stack blocks as our building block. I'll have a slide which showed you uh, will show you uh, some more expansion on what what pipe works. Well, this is uh, most of you know. I'm uh, gonna not dwell on this, the chemistry of it that much. Um, basically, on the anode side uh, and the cathode side. It's easier to talk about. And the oxygen it, it forms uh, oxygen ions. That oxygen ions goes through the electrolyte and, uh, and then on the anode side reacts with the hydrogen and carbon monoxide. Of course, where does the hydrogen come? Hydrogen is not really available in nature. We do utilize um, uh, fossil fuel like the natural gas uh, to make that hydrogen. Or high temperature fuels of both molten carbon and SOFC are, are suitable actually to do that, what we call reforming reaction inside within the fuel cell. So you do not need an external reformer to do that job for you. The fuel cell construction, as is shown here, is a multi layers of ceramics. Um, on top, shown there, is cathode, which is uh, basically a conducting ceramic, is proprietary to our nature. Of, of the business, and uh, it's about 50 micron thick. And uh, then electrolyte is as thin as you want to have because its function is really transfer iron. And uh, you want to make it thin so that its resistance doesn't play any major role in the fuel cell. And the fuel, uh, anode size is, in this scenario, is, is the anode supported and it's a much thicker component. Actually, if you want to be fair, I show the whole picture, and it would go probably all the way to the floor. Like that. So it's a, the SEM is going to cut off. Uh, as I said, one of our claim to fame is that at earlier stage of R&D, we actually look on, on the, in the uh, long term of manufacturing. So we do have uh, a pilot plant manufacturing at uh, our Calgary um, uh, uh, facilities, uh, which is run by Aversal Power Systems. And uh, uh, the manufacturing basis for our technology is, uh, our acronym is TSC, which stands for tape casting, screen printing, and co-firing. Basically, we tape cast our anode, and, uh, and then we put layers of uh, cathode, and I mean, electrolyte and cathode, 
um, uh, through screen printing, and then we fire them all together to make the fuel cell. And as I mentioned, we have built uh, cells of about 1,000 centimeters square. Um, currently, our baseline standard cell stack cells are about 525 centimeter square of 625 overall, and it's shown in the mirror picture. Well, this slide is good, shows the progression of our technology. As, as uh, Tim was mentioned, CICA uh, is a uh, program uh, basically supported by the Department of Energy. Um, if you look at the, the performance of cells which ran for more than three, four years, uh, in 2002-2005 frame, um, we had our, our back then our cell technology were about uh, one one and a half percent degradation per thousand hours, and um, they we had that technology acronym as TSC2. Again, TSC stands for tape casting, screen printing, and co firing. In uh, 2008, uh, uh, to to close this time, we started developing better cells and uh, some of the intermediate uh, uh, cell technologies that we, uh, some of the cells that we actually developed around 2008 and is running to, to the present time is uh, showed a significant improvement. But uh, the cell technologies that we actually developed around 2009 timeframe and that's the technology that we have today we're using shows impressively better, uh, better stability of operation uh, something that we actually think is good for applica applications and, and uh, uh, commercial production. This shows you uh, uh, the performance of those improved, improved cells. Uh, uh, on the, the x-axis is the current density and the, the performance of voltage is the y-axis. And as you see, even at 650 degrees C, a voltage of 0.8, we can get 0.4 watt per centimeter square. This is very important because you can get uh, milliwatt per centimeter square, high power densities, but it's important to have it at very high voltages. Even at 0.8 volt at uh, 600 degree centimeter, 650 degrees C, we can get 0.4 watt per centimeter square. So our cells are very, very high power densities. So how do we go from small cell all the way to stacks and large modules? So this is the approach we take. Typically, we take this lab scale cell, we scale them up, uh, then take the scale, the area that we, we think is commercially viable, we take those cell areas and then we stack them up, go on height, and then uh, that comes to the point that we think that's a good building block. Now that's of the stacks. Now that we take this stack building block and then put it maybe on top of each other or make what we call a stack tower. And then take that stack tower and we can put it in uh, vessels and arrange them like a stack uh, module. Uh, either uh, we can arrange them horizontally as shown in top, top uh, uh, rendering there. It's, it's a 1.2 megawatt stack module built of just core manufactured stacks of 15 kilowatt, and the bottom shows a concept of a 250 kilowatt. Yes, sir. Um, I'm curious with the manufacturing process that you described. What is what what is the opportunity for recharging, remanufacturing um, cells that have lost efficiency over time? In other words, uh, you know, as that chart approaches the previous chart. Oh, oh. Uh, <laughs> Oh, can you recycle it? Well, let's go to the next slide. I think I have actually, uh, this is one of the stacks. And uh, I just want to remind everybody, every year is about 8,000 hours. So this is close to three years of operation. It doesn't come easy. This number doesn't come easy. So this shows a stack and shows about uh, three mole, uh, millivolt per thousand hours or about 0.4 percent uh, uh, degradation. This, at that level of degradation, uh, it's a commercial unit because you expect degradation of every five, six years uh, uh, 
uh, changeover of the stack. And the reason that's accepted uh, by industry, if you look at gas survey industries, um, by the customers of the gas turbine industry, it was accepted that every five years actually uh, take the gas turbine through overhaul, which is very close to a stack changeover. Uh, gas turbines also degrade with time, and the degradation is very close to 0.3% uh, per thousand hours. And uh, so you would expect, uh, I mean, the co customer is accepted that after five years, they will uh, lose about 7-8% of their power. So with that said, uh, now, am I, have I answered your question? Uh, the first part, yeah. I mean, when you do a stack replacement, how, uh, how reusable are those materials? Uh, to a certain extent, you can use quite a bit of it, especially steel. And uh, some nickel, which has been used in this, can be, it has a value, and they can be recycled. So, uh, but maybe, I guess I went through this. This is a stack that uh, was built three years ago and it's been operating for quite close to three years now. And the degradation is, is very, very good in terms of stability of performance is um, close to 0.4% per thousand hours of operation. Um, as I said that we take this, stack building blocks and we configure larger larger uh, uh, modules and the stack towers. This is a stack tower, it's a 30 kilowatt and uh, as you see there are two stack blocks. This this uh, was, uh, this came online in our facility about uh, sometime in June, July and it was uh, part of the DOE program that we have. We have the Department of Energy, the under SECO program to test, and the, uh, the 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 main objective of the test actually to test this under realistic system condition, thermally sustainable, not in the laboratory. May uh, show that demonstrate that this actually can be put in the module and can run if someday we put that into a system as a system component. Um, one of the modules that was built, uh, a 60 kilowatt module, this was actually sent to uh, Europe, to Finland, um, and was tested, uh, hooked up to a facility that was built by Wurzilla. I'm not sure if you're familiar, Wurzilla is one of the big diesel generators uh, uh, in the engines in Europe. And um, they, it was tested in their facility it's a 60 kilowatt, it was designed to for 59.9, almost 60 kilowatt, and actually they got 60 kilowatt out of it, and the module efficiency was 59%. What it was, as you notice, is actually was based on our older cell technology, TSC2. Uh, following following that, that module, about six months later, we built another 60 kilowatt module which was tested in our facility in Danbury, Connecticut, was grid connected. And uh, this time we use our current cell technology and, um, and uh, was designed for 60 kilowatt. We got 60 kilowatt gross out of it and an efficiency of about 64%. We ran it about 80% utilization and 64% is very impressive the efficiency if you are in the business of uh, counting efficiencies. And this unit is still uh, operating in our facility and if you happen to be in our area, I'll be more than happy to show it. This shows the voltage uh, groups from that particular module. It's uh, pretty uniform and that's one of the one of the uh, challenges that when you put large power plants to make sure things work equally well, you know, together. Based on that technology that we develop, uh, we have, uh, we are currently designing a 60 kilowatt power plant. Uh, this shows uh, uh, kind of our 3D rendering of that uh, power plant. Uh, it consists of three main sections. Uh, in the middle, you see the, set, uh, the stack module itself. Uh, one side of that stack module, it's uh, what we call mechanical balance plan. 
uh, basically includes uh, the blowers and uh, uh, so the sulfurization uh, units and control uh, units. And the other side is electrical power supply, which, which is basically uh, direct DC to AC inverters as an electrical portion of it. And um, the, the gross efficiency is about 70, uh, I mean, sorry, the power, gross power from fuels is about 70 kilowatt. After you take the pyrogenic, uh, you end up close to 63 kilowatt from that uh, fuel cell. Nominally, we call this 60 kilowatt. And um, of course, uh, you have about 20 kilowatt still left over for heat recovery. So overall net efficiency in a CHP application could go as high as 63%. But the electric uh, portion of it is uh, pretty high, it's about 60%. And that's a unit that uh, hopefully we, we're hoping that someday actually we build it and the first one of it will be installed uh, at uh, uh, here, 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 or here. <coughs> We're going to fight over it. <laughs> so uh, the topic of my talk was a stationary uh, fuel cell system. So I thought that uh, just put a slide to talk about some other projects that we are working with more of a defense related. Um, I myself uh, manage a project with the uh, Office of Naval Research on um, underwater vehicle application where we're looking at the solid oxide to be actually incorporated under underwater. Uh, there are challenges uh, uh, with, with that, uh, those type of services or application. One being is that there's no air underwater. So, so uh, the other project that uh, being handled by our Universal Power System partners uh, is a DARPA Walter II project, uh, which they are looking for very high energy density. Actually, the fuel cell electrolyzer combined that can go out up there for a number of days. And uh, for the, you know, there. that project uh, is being uh, um, sponsored by DARPA, but Boeing uh, and it's to Boeing and Boeing found plots. In summary, SFC technology plays a significant role in future of energy. I'm pretty sure about that. There's no doubt in my mind. Uh, uh, the technologies that, that we are looking at on site distributed generation, a small units that 60 kilowatt uh, for natural gas or biogas are very active. Maybe years from now, we're looking at large demonstration units, you know, coal gas. Um, another topic that I really didn't uh, talk about, you see uh, our artistic rendering of that, you know, one megawatt module, those green boxes of fuel cell. That's uh, the program we have under our CICA program to look at coal gasification uh, and, and uh, fuel cell itself. And it's pretty challenging, but you see that maybe 15 to 20 years from now, you will have uh, fuel cells which run off coal gas. Um, and of course, the high power density and high energy efficiency um, uh, demonstrating program, which is uh, meeting commercialization goals, and those are the current programs we do have. And with that said, uh, I thank you all, and uh, I'm ready for our questions.